Hello everyone, and welcome again to Middle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters for making this video possible, and we would also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description for more details. My name is Saba, and today we are continuing to investigate various tests for market efficiency that can be used to determine whether stock prices follow random walks or not. And we have already covered quite a lot of those tests in previous videos, and one of the first videos on such topics was dedicated to the simple walden wolfowitz runs test, where we separated our sample, notably uh, S&P 500 returns over a five-year period, into two subsamples, uh, above and below the median, or, which is quite natural in case of stock returns, above or below zero. And then we considered how many runs, that is, sequences of observations belonging to the same subsample, above or below the median, above or below zero, that is, we have observed. And then we compared it to the theoretical expected value that we would have observed if the stock returns followed a random walk procedure. And then the difference could be converted into a Z-stat and the p-value to examine the probability that such a deviation from the expected value occurred due to random chance. And that gave us an intuitive and powerful framework for testing market efficiency. But what happens if we separate our sample into more than two subsamples? Could you do that? Turns out you can. And that is due to a clever generalization of the runs test by Barton and David in their 1957 paper titled Multiple Runs. Quite simply and intuitively, isn't it? To apply it to our sample of S&P 500 returns over a five-year period, so 1,258 observations in total, we first need to convert our returns into percentiles. So basically to calculate the empirical cumulative distribution function. The simplest way to do that would be to apply the rank function to each and every of our returns, referring to the whole array over here, locking the rows, and sorting them in ascending order, so that the lowest returns are close to zero, and the highest returns are close to one, and then we need to divide it by the total number of observations plus one. So we have got them distributed on an interval from zero to one, non-inclusive. So divided by the count, we already know it's 458, but just for good measure, referring to the whole array over here and adding one in the denominator. And then we can bottom line it all the way down and convert every single return into the empirical distribution function value. And then we need to figure out what would happen if we break our sample down into k equal subsamples. In that case, k is equal to 2, 3, 4, or 5. And potentially you can go uh, as far up as your sample size allows. So here we could go uh, up to 20 without any notable issues and you are bounded from above only by your sample size again. So in case of k equals 2 we need to figure out as in the simple runs test which observations are above or below the median. And turns out we can generally apply the quotient function and our empirical distribution function values to figure that out and assign group IDs to our observations. So here we refer to our percentile and log the column over here, multiplied by the number of subsamples we want to divide our sample into, and log the row here, and as a denominator we always have one. So here, in k equals 2 case, we'll naturally uh, convert all of our observations into zeros or ones, zeros being below the median, one being above the median. And if we drag it across and bottom right click it all the way down, we'll see that for every single case, k being equal to 2, 3, 4, and 5, we have broken down our sample into the respective number of subsamples. For example, this observation over here, return equal to plus 1.79%, is high enough, percentile is quite close to 1, that in every single case it belongs to the highest subsample the subsample with ID 1, so the second subsample when k equals 2, and so on and so forth. While this particular observation is uh, low enough, minus 1.83%, that it always belongs to the lowest subsample with the lowest return. 
while some observations like that, minus 0.03%, which is quite close to 50%, quite close to the median, is below the median for uh, k equals 2, naturally, that's lower than 50%, but for k equals 3, it's in the middle group, 0, 1, and 2, so it's right in the middle. For k equals 4, it's in the second group from the bottom, and for 5 groups, it's straight in the middle again. So now, we need to calculate how many runs of observations belonging to the same subsample we have observed in each of these cases. And actually, we can apply the if function and the sum function to get it in one formula. So here, in the observed number of runs, we can just consider whether the observation starting from the first observation and ending at the penultimate observation, so second before last, if the group ID, subsample ID, equals to the group ID of the following observation, so starting from the second observation up to the very last. And if that's indeed the case, if the group IDs are the same, it means that the run is continuing, so we have got no new run emerging, so zero. And if they are different, then it means that the run of observations belonging to a particular group has ended, and the new run of observations belonging to a different subsample has begun. So it means that we have to put in 1 over here. And then we need to sum all of this array of zeros and 1s and add 1, as even if we had just one observation and uh, such a formula would give us 0, we would still have got one run of just this one single observation. So that plus one accounts for this marginal case. And now we can enforce this formula using shift control enter and get 658 runs for k equals 2. And as we drag it across, we get an ever-increasing number of runs as our number of subsamples increases. And that's quite natural and that's quite intuitive to observe because as we have got more subsamples, it's more likely that a run will break down and the following observation will belong to a new subsample. So now we have to figure out how different those numbers of runs are from the number of runs we would have expected if our data set would behave according to a random walk. And here, Button and David have developed some quite clever and general test statistics and uh, formulas to help us derive that. So here we see that quite differently from the Wall and Wolfowitz um, two subsample test, the Button and David multiple runs test operates in terms of the test statistic S. And the observed value of the test statistic S is just the difference between the number of observations in our uh, sample minus the observed number of runs. And the expected number of runs that you would have observed if the data set is behaving according to a random walk is the value of the function F2 over the number of observations n. What is F2 here? Well, f subscript j is actually a function that sums up all the number of observations in every single of your groups in subsamples raised to the power j. So basically, if you have got f2, it is the sum of squares throughout all of your subsamples. And f3 would be cubed, f4 would be to the fourth power, and so on and so forth. So that's just a clever subscript. Why do we need F2 and F3? Well, F2 we use to derive the expected value of the S statistic that then we compare to the observed value of the S statistic, but F3 is required to calculate the variance of the S statistic that is crucial to determine the significance of our deviation from the expected result. So the variance of S is defined in terms of F2, F3, and the number of observations N. So quite easily, we can generalize it to as many subsamples as we want. The only thing we need at this stage is to calculate how many observations have we got in every single subsamples. So here we can just apply the count if function, enforce it for this particular array, lock in the rows here as we want it to change as we drag it across different numbers of subsamples, but we don't want it to change as we drag it down to calculate the number of elements in every single subsample ID, and then we need to refer to this particular subsample ID in this particular column, and we lock the column over here. So here we can see that for k equals 2, where we have got just two subsamples, the observations are evenly spread between the two 
uh, subsamples we are concerned with. And as we drag it across, we see that in every single case, because of the procedure we applied with the quotient function, our breakdown of observations between subsamples is as even as possible. So that's uh, actually useful to maximize the statistical power of the test. And here we can already calculate the values of F2 and F3 by summing up the observations in every single subsample raised to the power of 2, so squared for F2, and cubed for F3. So we can just copy it here, change this 2 into a 3, and enforce this formula. And we can drag it across to calculate F2 and F3 for all of our cases of all potential subsample breakdowns. And here we need to calculate the value of our uh, S statistic and the expected value of the S statistic. So S is equal to the number of observations we've got, and uh, we already know that it's 1258, but for good measure, we can just refer to the total count of returns over here, locking it all both row and column wise, and subtracting the number of runs we have calculated over here. So this is the observed value of the S statistic. We can drag it, and it is smaller and smaller for higher values of K, which is unsurprising because the number of observations stays the same and the number of runs increases. But what is the expected value of the S statistic? Well, to do that, we have to remember this particular formula and divide F2 by the total number of observations, which is, again, the count of all returns. And we see that we would have expected the value of the S statistic to be equal to 629, uh, but we actually observed a value of the S statistic equal to 600, meaning that actually we have observed 29 more runs than we would have expected, meaning that if anything, our data is actually mean reversing, meaning that we have more runs than expected, meaning that observations jump between subsamples more often than we would have expected. And we can already generate some intermediate inferences from just the values of S and the expected value of S. We see that the expected value of S is quite a bit higher than the observed value, meaning that there are quite a bit more runs observed in the data than warranted by a random walk assumption. It implies that observations are flipping between subsamples more often than it would be in the random case, and it implies that the data series is mean reverting, meaning that there is anti-persistence in stock returns, and that could actually warrant uh, some trading strategies based on stock return reversals. But if we drag this across, we see that for k equals 3, the relationship actually flips. The value of s is higher than the expected value of s, meaning that for three subsamples, our data set is actually persistent. It's more likely that observations stay within their subsample than flipping into others. And why is it the case? We'll investigate a little bit later when we have applied the rigorous testing procedure. First of all, we have to calculate the difference between S and the expected value of S. So just applying the difference and dragging it across. And then we need to use the values of F2, F3, and the number of observations N to calculate the variance of S. So here we can just translate this formula into the language of Excel by applying F2 times N minus three, so 1258 minus three divided by N, so 1258 times n minus 1, so 1258 minus 1. Then the second component is f squared, so this cell squared, divided by n squared, so 1258 squared, times n minus 1, so 1258 minus 1. Then we make sure that we have closed the parentheses correctly, and the final component is with the minus sign, 2 times f3, so this cell over here, over n, 1258, times n minus 1, 1258 minus 1. And that's the variance of our S statistic, but to calculate the standard deviation, we just need to apply the square root to it, and we see that the standard deviation of S is 17.7. And dragging it across, we can calculate the standard deviation for all of our subsample breakdowns. And here, we can actually calculate the Z set already by just dividing the difference by its standard deviation as usual, and dragging it across, we get a negative that stat, applying 
a mean reverting processes for k equals 2, positive z stats for k equals 3 and 5, and uh, quite a bit higher uh, z stat for k equals 5 actually, and uh, a z stat that's roughly close to 0 for k equals 4. And now we can convert those into p-values to determine how likely it is that such a deviation from the expected value of s is due to random chance alone by applying the two-tailed z test, 2 times 1 minus norm s dist, the absolute value of the z stat here, and input in 1 so that we've got the cumulative distribution function. And here we get a p-value of 10.13%, which is quite alarmingly close to the significance threshold of 10%, meaning that we barely satisfy the random walk assumption. And the p-values are quite a bit higher for all other cases, only this being quite close to 20%, but still uh, too high to be too suspicious about it. But let's approach this particular issue. Why do we have negative z stats for k equals 2 and to lesser extent k equals 4, and positive z stats for k equals 3 and all the more so for k equals 5? Well, in case of even number of subsamples, what we mostly detect is autocorrelation in the series. What is there any pattern in observations flipping between the groups of high return and low return? And that's the only thing the test detects when there are two subgroups, and uh, almost the only thing that the test can detect when there are four subgroups. However, when there is an odd number of subgroups, k equals 3 and k equals 5, we have got this pretty weird middle group with returns being quite low in magnitude and uh, being either positive or negative. So if the series is persistent in that case, it can actually measure that returns stay in this middle group and also that they are alterating between groups that are high in magnitude. So for example, the returns can jump from group one with very low return to group five with a very high return in case of k equals five, or they can stay within group k equals three with very low return in terms of magnitude, the return that's close to zero. And what that would imply is that groups of odd number of subsamples, these types of tests actually also measure heteroscedasticity. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. First of all, it's quite important to be able to test for both autocorrelation and heteroscedasticity in your data in one test, but when you arrive at a significant result, you cannot really be sure whether your significant p-value is due to either of those, due to autocorrelation, due to heteroscedasticity, due to both, or perhaps due to some non-linear dependence that is weirdly manifested in the data. And uh, to account for all of that, it's always the best practice to apply a battery of tests to throw everything you have and everything that is reasonably applicable to this data set to determine all possible facets of marked efficiency or time dependency when you are dealing with stock returns in particular. And that's all there is for the Barton David multivariate runs test. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions for videos in business economics or finance you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel or consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much and stay tuned.